Um, so what I'm going to do today for you is give you a, a this is going to go very quickly. So um, uh, I apologize for that because we could unpack an awful lot of this. Uh, but um, I'll take you through kind of where Edwards is a kind of a typical Enlightenment figure, but then also get into the Great Awakening and some of the aspects of that and some of the ways in which awakenings, a religious experience, nuances uh, the Enlightenment period uh, and beyond. And we see the creation, basically, of a revival culture that, especially in America, but certainly elsewhere in the world, uh, is, is still incredibly formidable and formative uh, today. That's probably your typical stereotype, maybe, of Edwards with his fire and brimstone and sinners in the hands of an angry god. We could go into that, but I, I, we just don't have time. So um, in terms of Edwards in the Enlightenment or versus the Enlightenment, um, you know, what, what we see in Edwards scholarship and beyond is a tendency uh, to view Edwards as a great opponent of the Enlightenment and the notion of the rationalization or reasonableness of religion in a kind of a re reductionist kind of way. Uh, so he's portrayed either as a, as a bigoted Calvinist opposing progress or as this champion of Christian truths against evil. Um, and that latter, of course, especially is the case with um, his many apologists um, within evangelical and, and conservative uh, Christian camps. Uh, and this continues down to this day. But there are two reassessments in progress. First of all, the nature of the Enlightenment itself. And, and again, uh, Edwards' relation to it and kind of a, a, a make him kind of a representative figure in this. So in the nature of the Enlightenment, I understand you've been talking about this, so I won't dwell too much on this. The early or the moderate phase and that's Henry May's um, title for it, uh, 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 of, the, of, the, of the Christian Enlightenment that identifies um, the, the early period of it. The later period, of course, gets much more, much more radical and anti-religious. Uh, so it may be more proper to speak of enlightenments uh, here. Um, and as, and as, as Bruce said, we have to remember that um, within the long 18th century, the age of enlightenment is also an age of awakenings. So there's, this, there's um, kind of a resurgence of the mind and of the spirit. But what's also important to remember about the enlightenment is that while we see uh, the enlightenment project and then uh, uh, paralleling and kind of mm, overlapping it, the evangelical project, um, the imperial project are, is strongly linked to both of these, right? Uh, empire. So it's colonization, it's enslavement, um, and so a lot of these things, uh, it cannot be kind of separated very easily, and we have to understand that it's very important uh, to see that uh, the Age of Enlightenment, the Age of Awakenings, is undergirded uh, by these realities. Edwards's relation to the Enlightenment, a um, couple of things. He adopted the spirit and techniques of the period in defense of what he viewed at orth as orthodox religion. I suspect that that's true of many figures uh, within the European, Anglo-American, and beyond uh, communities um, that, that uh, were seeing these new emphases in in scholarship, in theology, and biblical exegesis, and so forth, uh, coming out. And this includes dependence upon reason and experience, so there's a certain move towards subjectivity. Um, the accord of science and religion, science at the service of religion, uh, rejection of Aristotelianism, quite typical in this, in this period as well, through the 17th and 18th century. Um, uh, naturalism, a growing naturalism. In Edwards, that manifests in his typology. And Edwards is, is just a compulsive typologist. And in many ways, you could say he's one of the, he may be the last uh, of the great typologists. Uh, that is the tendency to see um, uh, scripture, nature, and human history as all 
having types or shadows or representations of, of divine um, thought, having lessons and languages uh, embedded in them um, discursively, ontologically. So it, 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 it's quite remarkable what he's doing there. And then the possibility of human progress, um, in particular his project on the history of the work of redemption, uh, which he's taking from, in part, he's taking from um, continental scholastics such as Coxius um, and, and, and Vitzius um, and their views of covenantal history. Maybe you're familiar with that. Um, and he's, he's taking that kind of doing a riff on that, importing um, the views of folks like John Milton, John Bunyan, and so forth and coming up with a new, what he calls an, an entire new method, a, a narrative of theology, a narrative theology in the uh, history of the work of redemption. Um, so while he's doing this, while he's, he's adopting um, some enlightenment uh, techniques, he's also resisting key trends. Um, he's a, he's a avid uh, opposer of anything that's crypto-deistic, um, anything that smacks of free thought, um, he defends uh, pre, uh, the predestinarian scheme, the neo-Calvinist scheme, including original sin and predestinarianism. Um, he critiques materialist philosophies such as Hobbes and Spinoza, um, and he remains very neo-Platonic and neo-Augustinian. Um, Yale historian Sidney Alstrom, uh, I like this particular description of Edwards. Uh, he called him a Dortian philosoph. So he's, um, he's ascribing to the canons of the Synod of Dort, uh, but he's also paying attention to what's going on um, in the larger field, if you will, in the larger theological, philosophical uh, fields and, 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 and kind of trying to reconcile uh, those things. Uh, delivering the full Christian message as transmitted by his reformed and Puritan forebears, uh, composing many, many treatises uh, uh, around polemical and apologetic issues, um, speculative theology around the Trinity, for example, around um, ontology. He, he, he um, uh, develops a very dispositional ontology um, he becomes very idealistic with a capital I. So he's following folks like um, Malbranche in France and Barclay in England um, and espousing kind of a phenomenological idealism, which is quite, quite unique um, and, and so on. And then again, uh, ultimate mode of expressing the meaning of Christian faith is through sacred history, history of the work of redemption. Um, Edwards' intellectual world used to be uh, portrayed quite romantically. Uh, the 19th century uh, critic Leslie Stevens portrayed Edwards as a German professor mistakenly dropped in the American wilderness. <laughs> um, but Perry Miller, mid 20th century Harvard historian, perhaps most responsible for the kind of the renaissance of Edwards, um, portrayed him as this, what he called an aboriginal monolith. Uh, this uh, isolated genius in the wilderness, and that kind of you know increased Edwards's cachet, uh, and it kind of made sense to Miller because that's how he saw himself. Uh, but more recently, more structuralist views to Edwards see him as highly connected to the transatlantic world of ideas and books, which is called the Republic of Letters. Um, for him, London was downtown, right? Uh, he's very eclectic in his reading and influences. He uses Roman Catholic scholastics as well as bi Protestant biblicists, emphasizing the Catholicity of post-Reformation sources. And he blends British empiricism, especially Locke, uh, and the work of Newton. Um, he's reading Locke and Newton as a, as a, as a teenager, uh, even before he comes to Yale to do his work. He, he, by the way, he got his undergraduate and his graduate degrees here, uh, a little earlier than you guys. Um, but he blends British empiricism, 
uh, the essay on human understanding and so on, this new way of seeing uh, how we know things, the epistemology, with continental scholasticism, and that includes people like uh, Petrus von Maastricht, the Dutch, Dutch theologian, and, um, and, and Francis Turretin, the Genevan theologian. Um, let's run through the quickest. So the Great Awakening itself as an important manifestation of enlightened religion uh, begins in the mid-1730s um, and uh, specifically in Northampton, Massachusetts. And uh, it's in this period that Edwards is preaching. He starts to see what he calls flexibility. Um, he's preaching um, on standard um, issues such as justification by faith alone, uh, but also on the importance of uh, not derogating from the glory of God and things like this. And these start to yield fruit. He starts to see people becoming more and more what he had affected. And we'll talk about affections in a little bit. There are some local legacies here. His own father had a history as a revivalist, uh, a series of spiritual harvests in East Windsor Hill, Connecticut, which is right across from Hartford. Um, his grandfather, who he succeeded at uh, Northampton, Solomon Stoddard, was also known for uh, having a very sophisticated conversion psychology and um, a, a history as a revivalist there, a series of, of revivals. And then there are international influences as well. One of them uh, in the early 1730s is the, um, uh, the expulsion of the Protestants from Salzburg, uh, in 1731-32. And uh, there are approximately well, uh, tens of thousands of Protestants ended up leaving at the order of the Catholic authorities in this constant back and forth of you know, who, uh, who dominates that area. And wherever they went, and they ended up in all parts of Europe, Prussia, for example, took a lot of them in, but they even end up in North America, places like Pennsylvania, um, and wherever they go, there are revivals. There are these mass conversions and um, exciting sorts of events. And these are reported in the newspapers that, that Edwards and his colleagues read avidly. So these are the sort of events that he can refer to. Another one, uh, another uh, influence from abroad is um, uh, Franca and, and uh, Ahala and uh, his great project, the Grossa Aufsatz. Uh, which is an evangelical complex that he establishes for uh, orphans and for the training of ministers and the printing press and, and so on and so forth. It's this very large um, uh, organization that is meant to uh, educate, uh, distribute literature, um, and, and, and practice charity. And, and that's very influential as well. Um, uh, Franca's conversion narrative is printed. It's hugely popular and so forth. So those are the sort of models. There's a, there's a portrayal, actually, of the complex itself. It's, it was huge. Look at it. it had, at one time, it had 1,000 students in it. Um, it was, it was quite, quite something. Um, how Edwards attempts to bring all of this together is to preach on what he calls the divine and supernatural light. And here's the uh, title page of his sermon from 1734. And this is an important uh, early sermon expressing his views on enlightened religion, where he talks about the divine and supernatural light being uh, um, immediately imparted to the soul by God of a different nature from that any that is obtained by natural means. So he's upholding the supernatural aspect of the conversion process, of the regenerative process. Right? It's not through anything that humans can do, right? And there's no merit in, in anything that we can do. We're not going to derogate from the glory of God by taking that away. Um, this light, he says, is a true sense, right? It's a sense in the Lockean, you know, version of, of the word. It's a true sense of the divine excellency of the things revealed in the word of God and a conviction of the truth and reality of them thence arising. So he calls this where Locke is laying out five, the five senses of the body as ways that we um, accrue and process 
knowledge and reflectives is simple knowledge and, and complex and, and so on and so forth. Um, Edward says, yes, there's that, but there's also a spiritual sense. And he calls this a new sense or a sense of the heart. And that's the, that identifies the, um, the uh, uh, aspect of human nature, the soul, that um, accepts this um, divine and supernatural light uh, uh, given by, by God through the Holy Spirit that renovates our capacity, that renovates our faculties. His, his theology is built on uh, three uh, kind of pillars. Scripture, right? He's right in the Reformed tradition in that sense. Uh, but then also reason, okay? Now, you know, post-Reformation orthodoxy, Reformed orthodoxy, of course, is all, all along is strongly emphasizing reason. But by the 18th century, that has a particularly um, uh, important valence uh, to it, that that reason uh, is an important, uh, more and more important and more and more nuanced kind of um, um, quality. And then human experience also becomes, uh, for Edwards, another important aspect. So that's why so much of what he does is narrative and what he does is history. Right? Um, he, there, he calculates that there are several hundred souls savingly converted in, the, in the, uh, what is called the Little Awakening or the Connecticut Valley Revival within Northampton alone. It spreads to several dozen towns up and down the Connecticut River Valley, uh, including New Haven, by the way. Um, and uh, he later um, summarizes this, describes it in what's called the narrative of the surprising work of God. Um, some people poo-poo it like Timothy Cutler, uh, the one-time rector of Yale College, who in 1722 declared his conversion to the Church of England. Um, that was not very kindly looked upon by the trustees of the college, and they summarily booted him out. Uh, but he went to England and received Episcopal ordin ordination. And then, uh, just to piss everybody off, he came back to uh, New England and made himself a total pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, centering himself in Boston and criticizing all things having to do with, with Puritans or, and dissenters, uh, such as Edwards. All right. so. But the faithful narrative, um, here Edwards employs a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, he uses history, gives it an account of Northampton's history, Demographics, he looks at age cohorts and how each is affected or not affected. He uses psychology. Uh, he develops an increasingly sophisticated uh, convergence psychology. And he uses biography, right, which goes back to one of the pillars of experience as being important. And sp specifically, he focuses on two uh, women in the, in the town, uh, one a 20-year-old woman named Abigail Hutchison, who is, um, who is dying, and then also famously the four-year-old Phoebe Bartlett, uh, who he considers, four years old, he considers to be a recipient of the divine and supernatural light, undoubtedly. Interesting. Uh, the faithful narrative is translated into several languages very quickly, and it kind of serves as a manual for revivalists uh, abroad makes Edwards famous as a chronicler of revival um, uh, in many, many, in many, many communities. But there's a problem. After the awakening, uh, Edwards sees some real problems with his congregation. Um, he uh, sees them very quickly slipping back into their sinful ways beforehand. They're contentious. They're greedy. Uh, they're not charitable. Um, uh, and, and, and they're, uh, 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 you know, observing different kinds of uh, vicious practices as he, as he sees them. So he commences some strenuous remedial efforts. Um, he stresses not only the divine light, but also divine living. So seeking that balance of justification and sanctification, right? Um, he preaches some humongous sermon series. 
um, on various parables or subjects. He preaches um, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, that's a that's a 16 sermon unit, uh, 16 sermons on that one text. Uh, the history of the work of redemption he does in this time. That's 30 sermons. Uh, he does a sermon series on the wise and foolish virgins, which is about 20 sermons. So he's he's getting very serious. He's drawing on his reformed preaching legacy uh, to deliver these these very stringent and um, exacting kinds of of, 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 of uh, sermon series. And then he's also listening to news from abroad and particularly hears about this guy, George Whitfield, otherwise known as the Grand Itinerant. And it's with Whitfield's uh, arrival in um, New England in 1740 that the first, the main phase of what's called the Great Awakening is usually considered to, to begin if, if the Connecticut Valley Rival is kind of a wind up. Uh, this is the this is the main act, if you will. Um, Whitfield would make many preaching tours to America over the course of his life. I think it's seven, all told. Hugely popular. Um, people would flock by the thousands to hear him. Um, and uh, Edwards was a great admirer of her and he of him, and he invited him to come to Northampton, and he did in October of seventeen. 40 and, and where Whitfield preaches a number of times. Here's just some basics uh, about, about Whitfield. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's part of the, um, the Oxford Club, the, the New Methodists. He's an associate of the Wesleys. But then they break. They have a split. And the Wesleys go in a more Arminian direction. Ed, uh, uh, Whitfield goes in a more Calvinist uh, direction um, and uh, uh, the Wesleys of course go on to establish an organization whereas uh, Whitfield goes on to establish a charismatic reputation so two different strategies there um, preaches all over England Scotland uh, America Amer British American colonies um, open-air revival um, becomes the first international media star, five, oh, five, five preaching, five times on preaching tours. Uh, highly dramatic and intense uh, preaching, simple gospel conversion messages. It was clearly the delivery that was important about Whitfield, because when you read his printed sermons, they're rather flat. So it's the way he was able to dramatize um, what he was talking about that was clearly uh, his draw. Uh, uses mass media, um, and he demands and elicited an incredible response, biggest gatherings in colonial history. There's a whole lot we could do to unpack this, but uh, we see changes uh, kind of before and after the Great Awakening in several ways, speaker, audience, scene, occasion, style, message. Sp speaker beforehand, is traditionally the ordained, settled pastor. The speaker, as a result of the Great Awakening, could increasingly be unordained, lay people, could be women, it could be uh, enslaved and freed persons, um, it could be uh, the uh, native speakers, and, and so on and so forth. In other words, the, the range of who could speak after this uh, greatly widened and had a great effect. Uh, audience, um, the uh, audience uh, could be uh, mixed as well. Well, it was before you have the um, the, uh, the seated congregation in a ecclesiastical, you know, in a meeting house setting. It's all uh, ordered socially, uh, a reproduction of the community, if you will. Um, audience after, or in, or at, and after the Great Awakening becomes. Um, mixed, uh, all classes and, and, and varieties uh, uh, were assembled uh, regardless of, of order and rank. Um, scene could change from ecclesi that ecclesiastical, that meeting house, to anywhere, to out in the, you know, outside, under a tree, uh, in a barn, in a field, uh, and so forth. That, one of the big uh, 
occasions likewise changed from being purely on the Sabbath to any day of the week. All right? um, could be morning, could be evening, could be multiple days, the, kind of the prototype of the modern camp meeting. Um, style is changing, rhetoric is changing, where minister before would climb into the desk. It wasn't a pulpit, it was a desk, and would deliver a prepared sermon, usually from notes. Uh, what happens in the Great Awakening is you see extemporaneous preaching arising. Whitfield is extremely famous for this. What he's really doing, though, is performing uh, a series of sermons that he basically has memorized. Right? He was a great. He was he was an actor in college, and he brings those techniques to the pulpit. Um, message as well, um, where before the ministers are blaming the people. It's your fault, it's all your sins that God is punishing the land. Afterwards, it's the other way around. The people are accusing the ministers. It's your fault. You're wolves in sheep clothing. You're false leaders. We have to look elsewhere. In fact, we have to look to ourselves for leadership, right? So it's kind of an, so it's an inverted Jeremiad. So this results in the division of the religious leaders in New England and elsewhere. In New England, that division is known as the old lights versus the new lights. In the middle colonies, more Presbyterian, it's the old side and the new side, so forth. So these social tensions that are created as a result of um, unregulated audiences and, and itinerants coming in without permission to preach and unregulated crowds and things like this and unregulated pr uh, speakers uh, creates these social tensions. They begin to boil over and create this major, major split. Here are two representatives of the, the parties here, Charles Chauncey of Boston and, and, and Gilbert Tennant, actually a um, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania Presbyterian. Uh, it's Chauncey who delivers a sermon and prints it called Enthusiasm, described and cautioned against uh, in 1742, uh, in which he's coming out against the practices and the theology, the divine and supernatural light and its, and its um, ramifications, um, reputing not only theology but also characters in the process. The old lights in return, caricature Whitfield. Uh, here's, a, here's a famous uh, cartoon. Uh, Dr. Squintum, they called him because he, he was cross-eyed. You knew that, <laughs> didn't you? Uh, so they made great fun of that. And they attacked him and his peers uh, for illicit sexuality, avarice, fame and power, and, and so on. Um, Here's, the, here's a famous sermon by Tennant, The Danger of an Unconverted Ministry. So here's actually a minister taking up the call of, of, the, of the dissatisfied laity and saying, beware of the ministry. If, they're not, if your ministers aren't converted, you shouldn't follow them. You should depart from them. You should separate. Where's Edwards on all this? He's excited about the revivals. He believes that they're primary vehicles by which God advances human history. He sees this as an authentic work of God, right? Um, accelerating the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. Throws himself into revival preaching, you know, doing sinners, uh, sermons like sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, that's an Enfield in July of 1741. Um, the church doesn't exist anymore. They have a, they have a rock out front. Which is very anticlimactic, but but there it is. Um, there perhaps is a more popular view of, of Edwards at Enfield. Um, the, the 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 bookworm reading his manuscript while people are climbing the walls in terror. Uh, not quite, but it, it's fun. Um, so while he's supporting the revivals, believes they're a work of the Spirit of God, he's very frustrated by the laxity of his congregation and by, generally by what he sees as the, um, the laxity of the people of New England. Um, he's having less and less success with um, uh, his preaching. Uh, 
Um, he and his congregation are becoming more and more alienated. Uh, other people he invites in to supply his pulpit, like the young Samuel Buell, are actually more successful than he is. He's also very critical of revival excesses. He's critical of the old lights on the one hand because he believes they have bad theology. In over-rationalizing and relying too much upon the reasonableness of religion, he says you're limiting the Spirit's work and you're overemphasizing the role of ministers. Um, he also uh, sees them as uh, espousing a tradition-driven critiques of new things in the church. He says you have to allow for new things to occur. It, it, that's biblical prophecy. But he's also very critical of the new lights, where he's, he's more along, he's more towards them on the spectrum, definitely. But he's also critical of them uh, because he sees them acting out their passionate experiences in unchristian and unscriptural ways. He sees them going careening kind of back and forth between, you know, I'm saved, and then going the next day and, you know, back to their old vicious habits, back to the tavern, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and because they forget the three epistemological pillars. So he begins a series of treatises on the revivals in which he's uh, providing his observations, and he gets into what he calls signs and marks of true and false work of God, both generally and individually in the soul. Uh, the first is the distinguishing marks of the work of the Spirit of God, published in 1741, um, which actually was delivered as the Yale commencement address in September of that year. Did you know that? Did you know that? Right, right down on the green. Um, and so, again, here the Great Awakening, a big ferment with, right in our midst. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. The next one was Some Thoughts concerning uh, the revival of religion in New England in 1743. Uh, and then uh, his kind of his magnum opus on uh, revivalism and conversion psychology, the treatise concerning religious affections, which I understand you read some selections from, right? Um, meanwhile, I think it's important to kind of take a little detour into the challenge of radical religions. Um, and this takes the form of mystical religions and of embodied religion, religious experience. And so we can look at, for example, quietism as an example of mystical religions that come down, you know, they're influenced by the medieval tradition coming down through, through this, the early modern period. Uh, quietism had its origins uh, in, in Italy and in France. Um, and one of its main figures was Madame Jean-Jean Guillon. Um, and who was uh, for her views about how it is that one achieve, can achieve union with God through the complete self abnegation of the self, um, through the complete abnegation of the self um, in this kind of very passive way of, of meditating and, and, and being. Um, uh, she was uh, imprisoned by the Catholic authorities, um, as was her defender. Uh, uh, Archbishop Francois Fenelon uh, of Cambrai, another important figure. Edwards, by the way, read both of these figures, as did his wife, Sarah Pierpont. Um, and the other one is an embodied religious experience. So here are manifestations. And what do we do with kind of this phys the physicality of religious experience? Is it, is it genuine? Is it real? Uh, how seriously can we take it? Um, and so embodied religious experience and lay prophecy in the early 18th century posed a real threat to what was known as enlightened religion, even to new laism. Um, and examples of these would be the French prophets or the commissar who came from the Languedoc uh, area of northwestern France originally. Um, and these are lay, lay religious leaders who claimed the visions from God um, and, and delivered these revelations and claimed to be able to uh, perform miraculous healings and even to be able to raise people from the dead. Um, they came to England and were hugely popular and also hugely vilified. Uh, so they became a, a kind of a, a, a arguing point down through the Great Awakening. Uh, 
And then also the convulsionaires of Paris um, in the 1720s and through the 30s. Um, uh, uh, people are assembling at the tomb of one of the deacons of the um, Cathedral of Paris, Maydard Be Be is his name. And in this, they start experiencing convulsions, fits, trances, levitations. Um, there are miraculous healings that occur. Um, thousands and thousands of people flock to this and, and have these sorts of experiences. The authorities try to clamp down on them, but they're very unsuccessful. These have connections, by the way, to the Jansenist movement. Um, so the Protestants in England and places like British North America are very sympathetic, actually, to the convulsionaires uh, because of that kind of, that kind of Calvinist connection that the Jansenists had with them. And then also in New England and elsewhere, the body was increasingly considered a source of religious knowledge, assurance, and authority, joining an enlightenment emphasis on sensation with a valorization of bodily manifestations, pointing to new ways of knowing that undermined the hierarchies of gender and race and to new conceptions of selfhood. So the enlightenment is, is putting forth this kind of the, the rational disembodied self, right, increasingly, whereas uh, embodied religious experience is actually posing an alternative to that, uh, that notion, that enlightenment notion. So the enlightenment itself is, is, is um, creating these new ways of conceiving of human, the human self, and what is it? And one of the, so you have in New England, miraculous healings like that of Mercy Wheeler, of, um, She's in Connecticut. I think she's in Lebanon, Connecticut. Um, and then also, I mentioned Edwards' spouse, Sarah Pierpont Edwards, native of New Haven. Um, in the early 1740s, she has um, uh, several weeks episodes of ecstatic experiences in which she's going into convulsions, agitations, um, what would be later called the jerks, I suppose, in the, in the, the Cane Ridge revivals. Um, she compulsively shouts. She can't stop herself, even in worship service, which is incredibly inappropriate at that time. Um, so she's disrupting the worship service. For a woman to do that is unheard, no pun intended, unheard of. Um, and um, she's going into trances. Uh, she's having dreams and, and visions and things like this. So it's, it's, it's quite, quite remarkable. So. Even so, in his own home, in his own marriage, Edwards is being confronted with a challenge to his views on what is, the, what are the true signs and marks of a work of the Spirit of God. So he's trying, in the midst of all this, to carve out a middle path that tries to minimize the dangers of both extremes um, through revival, of religious affections, through his theology of affections, uh, where he says what the what the heart loves. The will chooses and the mind justifies. What the heart loves, the will chooses and the mind justifies. So he's very much a voluntarist, right? In the Augustinian tradition, right? Um, negative signs, so he constructs negative and positive signs, and he has about 12 of each. Um, so negative signs, these are things that do not necessarily demonstrate a work of the Spirit of God. So in answer to folks like his, his spouse, he says, uh, you know, the intensity of outward demonstrations may indicate that what you're experiencing is a true work of the Spirit, but it also it may not, right? You have to take it with other factors, he's saying. Much vocal praise of God, helpful scriptures popping into the mind, so assurance of salvation, right, and so forth. But also the positive signs, and the, again, 12 of these, and uh, these are things that he sees as essential, as vital to a true work of the Spirit of God. And, and there are some of them. There, I, I, I put them up. Um, and for him, the 12th sign is the most important. This is when he dwells on the longest, which is that true religious affections manifest themselves in Christian practice, right? By their fruits, you shall know them. So he seeks that balance that he was trying to achieve in the midst of the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, 
coming from the divine and supernatural light, but then also saying, well, okay, that itself, that intuitive subjective experience by itself has to have objective truth to it, objective manifestation. <clears throat> 